Our next presentation will be my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Tunch Tiriaki, who's going to talk about his research and progress in regenerative medicine. Tunch. Uh, Diane, thank you very much. Steve, thanks for uh, the great introduction. Um, yeah, let me just take it one step ahead, then we will listen to the master of exosomes, Diane. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I also agree with Steve that we see this as a revolution in progress in regenerative uh, medicine. Uh, so these are my disclosures. None of them is going to uh, affect what I'm going to talk today. And yeah, I just wanted to make it a bit more sexy <laughs> to start this presentation. I want to, to, I want to take you back uh, in time uh, to the vampire stories. Now, you know, uh, all these vampire stories are based on one fact. These guys, they are uh, drinking uh, beautiful young people's blood. Why? Uh, to stay immortal. Uh, there is one thing what we know about the vampires. They are immortal, and in order to keep immortal, they have to drink young blood. Uh, very interesting, the recent studies provide endless information about how this can extend the life. And these vampire st stories start having uh, or gaining reality, uh, actually, with our recent publications. So that is actually uh, letting us to start talking about aging, which is very much related to stem cell deactivation, uh, telomere shortening, inflammation, uh, deposition of toxic material, uh, mitochondrial dis dysfunction, etc. And yeah, it has been our quest forever to try to stop aging, uh, to seek for immortality. And the only proven way until now uh, to reverse aging is actually parabiosis. Uh, what is parabiosis? Parabiosis is actually um, putting two living creatures together, suturing their blood circulations together so their blood uh, mixes uh, into each other. Para means alongside and bios means living. So we know from these like uh, interesting uh, publications, this is, this is hardcore data, if you just suture one old mice and one young mice together, what happens in, in, in a matter of three days is the uh, young mice starts getting older and the old mice uh, starts getting younger. So what's happening uh, there? is actually very interesting. By just joining the circulatory system, we are seeing immediate and visible changes in the heart, brain, muscle, uh, all of them becoming younger. Now, what is carrying this message of youth uh, in the blood? It is not the cells, that's what we know. Uh, it is the plasma, and actually, uh, these are the exosomes in the plasma. Now, that means we need to start really talking about exosomes. Uh, what are these? They, these are extracellular, very small uh, vesicles. I took this uh, from the website of Exoflow, Direct Biologics. It's a beautiful explanatory uh, simulation. So how, does, how do the cells communicate with each other? It's very simple. They create small uh, spheres from their own cell surface. They just uh, put them in, into the cell and they load these endosomes with information packs uh, with MRI and DNA. And these are then excluded from the cell. They are sent out from uh, the cells and they just uh, carry information to their target cells. So these are creating cell to cell communication. They carry information for different purposes, from anti-inflammatory response uh, to regrowth and everything. Uh, and they can, they do actually uh, really penetrate uh, the other cells. Now, uh, if we think uh, of each R cell, one of those like skyscrapers, uh, the highways are on blood vessels and uh, the cars, which are carrying humans and information, uh, can be considered as uh, the exosomes of our body. Uh, the current research on exosome is very much concentrated on the diagnosis of cancer, wound healing, cell signaling, 
uh, and of course also gene modification. And we can get these exosomes from various sources. We can get them from the plants. The problem of plant exosomes is uh, the information what they carry is going to be really far away from our, from, from our own organism. Um, we can get these exosomes from the animals, uh, which makes sense because they are very close to us. Uh, but then, of course, we have some other issues about that. You can get them from eggs, uh, other resources. Ideally, we would try to get these uh, from other humans, actually. Uh, and we know that they are capable of uh, doing tissue repair, tissue rejuvenation, uh, reduction of inflammation. And we know that they actually pass through the skin and blood-brain barrier, which is making them even more interesting. So you can use a topical uh, kind, kind of like pathway. Uh, as I said, you can use these exosomes as diagnostic material. We know all the diseases uh, exc excrete inflammation packs, exosomes, and if you can diagnose these exosomes, we can diagnose the, uh, these diseases, or uh, we can treat many different uh, diseases by changing the exosome environment of the body. But of course, with everything new and very exciting, we have problems. Uh, there are serious limitations of exosomes. Uh, one of them is the regulation. FDA has not uh, approved any exosome products for actually any use. Uh, it is, uh, the FDA is regulating stem cells and also exosome products, and this is a serious problem. On the other hand, they are right because we are having serious concerns about the safety. Why? Because exosomes are creating genetic material. They can change genetics. And moreover, uh, these are, let's imagine these are all pages going from one cell to the other. We cannot read what is written in those very exosomes. You cannot differentiate good exosomes or constructive exosomes from destructive exosomes. The only way how to make it safe is to have a safe source. Meaning if you can get exosome from a young creature, from young tissue, maybe uh, placenta, or any fetal organism or fetal blood, uh, you would say that these uh, exosomes are going to carry youth and health, uh, or you can get them from the stem cell cultures, uh, which can have also some limitations. Uh, if you create these, if you get these uh, cells from the stem cell cultures, uh, you need to have GMP facilities, it's going to be expensive. Uh, regulations are a problem. It is really hard to stabilize them in the GMP because you cannot stabilize. You are not allowed to stabilize anything when, if it's a GMP product. And of course, mass production is limited. Moreover, for us, cell culture uh, is an issue because after passage eight, uh, cellular senescence starts and it might be even dangerous uh, to get the exosomes out of these old cell cultures. That's why we started uh, checking the possibility of using allogenic or heterogenic sources like fetal calf exosomes. And we didn't stay there. Our research is going on on hybridization. So what is that? We, we are taking the exosomes from fetal blood or fetal plasma, and we are mixing them. We are hybridizing them uh, together with liposomes, uh, creating hybrosomes, which are slightly bigger and where which can be loaded with whatever you want. If you want to use them for the hair, for example, you can load your exosomes and liposomes with biotin, for example. Now let's take a look at the scientific res uh, results of us. Here you can see the, uh, the Brownian motion of the fetal animal hybrosome uh, characterization. This is uh, a sinacoanon, you, you have to see them. And here you can see the characterization of the nanoparticles. Uh, in the nanoparticle tracking analysis system. Uh, we, we know that the exosomes are around uh, 60, 70, up to 100 uh, nanometer, whereas liposomes are around 700 and the hybrosomes are going to be 180. The nice thing about this is this can escape us from uh, being bound by the nanoparticle regulations. Uh, here you can see the zeta potential ana analysis of the hybrosomes and exosomes, where we uh, have proven that they are all negatively charged, meaning they are exosomes. And by, by checking the regeneration capacity, uh, you can see uh, there's a, at least 50% increase in regeneration capacity uh, of the human umbilical endothelial cells and as well as keratinocytes uh, in the first three days. 
and in the fibroblast cell proliferation, proliferation assay, you can see if you just uh, poison the cell culture uh, with hydrogen peroxides and put exosomes into it, uh, you literally come back to the control level. So it is literally decreasing the, uh, the effect of the poison and inf inflammatory conditions. Uh, we can see the uh, cellular uptake of the hybrosomes as well as uh, collagen stimulation. Uh, if you put the hybrosomes into cell cultures, you start seeing the, the cells uh, producing collagen. And on the wound healing uh, analysis uh, in this like uh, scratch assay, uh, you can see in the control, uh, it takes around three days to heal the wound. And uh, if you add hybrosomes into it, it takes around 24 hours only. We have done some animal studies where we have seen that these are uh, literally non-toxic, but more interesting were our early clinical results. This is a um, diabetic ulcer, which has not been healed for the last six months uh, on the calf area. Uh, we started using uh, hybrosomes, just creams, topical. Uh, the, the second photo is after 10 days, and the third photo is after 20 days. So in three weeks time, they just got closed, which was amazing for us. This is uh, a colleague of mine who had done a, a reduction mastopexy, a non-healing area, one week of topical uh, hybrosome solution. And you can also use them, probably uh, Diane is going to share with us her experience about the hair. This is three weeks after topical treatment of exosomes. So let's review. Uh, our first finding uh, is we can successfully isolate exosomes from fetal blood and we can successfully hybridize them, uh, load them, and target them. Uh, these, these effects of the hybrosomes uh, seems to be great in wound healing. Uh, we have just preclinical pre and very early clinical data on that, but we have shown in the animal studies that they are non-toxic in whichever way you deliver them uh, to the animals. And these basically uh, hybrosome or exosome-based therapies are new strategies which are going to enable us to reduce inflammatory reaction, to increase the regenerative capacity, and as Steve said, uh, possibly increase our uh, results with fat crafting techniques, etc. There are, to summarize, there are four ways how to get them to the markets. You can use the cosmetic pathway with limitations. You can use the GMP pathway with other limitations. Uh, you can use medical devices to harvest autologous exosomes, which is actually a concentrated version of PRP uh, injections, or ideally, probably we will end up there. Uh, the pharma industry is going to be our way out if you want to do it properly. Uh, Diane, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tunch. That was really incredible and amazing. You always do great research work. Um, I have a, a quick comment um, because you mentioned there were quite a bit of limitations on just about any pathway. Are you restricted either in Turkey or in London from using exosomes in any way? Um, depends on which pathway we are talking about. If we are talking about cosmetic um, products, we are not. But of course, we can use them only topically. If you are talking about GMP products, uh, well, I mean, you can use them topically without any problem, uh, but they are having serious trouble by getting uh, permissions to be used. If you would create a medical device to harvest autologous exosomes, there would be no problem at all because it is autologous, it's going to be a medical device. And uh, from the pharmacological perspective, this is the only way I believe in long run uh, to be able to inject these exosomes IV or uh, intramuscularly, for example. So here's a scenario, because I know one of the um, US companies is um, working on the stage three of an IND for um, ARDS for use in um, acute COVID. And as well, they're working on a second one for use in long haul COVID patients. And so if there's an approval for exosomes in any way, shape or form, and this would be IV use, then theoretically you could use it off label 
but currently there is no approval. And I'm not sure how far away this is. I know that another company, um, Organicel, has gotten temporary approval for a small group of COVID patients uh, for emergency use. Is, do you have the same thing in Europe? Uh, yes, similar situation. And I think as, as, the, as the plastic surgeons, we have to make it clear you know, all these um, new vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna, they are simply based, based on uh, exosome treatments. They are using uh, messenger RNA. So it's the same technology. So why letting the world use all these uh, mRNA vaccines, whereas uh, binding our hands to use exosomes, right? Correct. I, I agree. It's the exact same technology. So... I yeah. think we'll yeah. see, see what develops. I, I feel like, you know, the currently the vaccines are only approved for emergency use and maybe the FDA feels like cosmetic aspect use is not so important. But I think wound <laughs> the wound healing aspect definitely is. Yeah. So we'll, we'll push ahead.